As you remain standing, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of the Gospel according to John. And hear now the Word of God that is offered to us this morning. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you please be seated and let us pray. Oh Lord, by your presence, bless us this morning. Stir among us. Bring about new life within us. For that to happen, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that Jesus Christ and he alone would be lifted up here. For where Christ is lifted up, there is a new life for us all. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let me, let me ask you a question. If you got to, to stay in a a room that was custom designed for you where all your needs were met all your meals were delivered it was peaceful and quiet there would you ever want to leave I mean that that sounds like living the life doesn't it well, let me ask you another question why does anyone want to be born because think about it, the womb is custom designed for you. All your needs are met, your food is delivered right to you, it's peaceful and quiet in there. I mean, it's, it's living quite the life. And if, if someone were to come to you in the womb and say, you know what, there's this great big world out there, you couldn't even imagine it. If somebody came to you and, and said that, that you're missing out on, on living life to the fullest, you would think they were just nuts. You got it all. If someone were to come to you and say, if you would just be born, you would grow so much bigger and have so much more experiences, you would wonder why bother You've got it all right here. I mean, it's dark, but it's your own little world. Why would anybody want to be born? Well, I think part of the answer is that, that after a while, you start to feel confined in your little world. And then you feel like you've been turned on your head in your little world. And then you're unsettled because of the rumblings of your little world. And you start to take it a little more seriously. There might be more to life than this. Another reason that you, you want to be born is, is because every once in a while, every once in a while you hear these distant muffled voices from beyond. And occasionally you feel these pokes and prods. You're not sure what they mean, but there's, there's just something about them and, and you want to, to know them more for some reason. 
When Joshua, our oldest child, was born, he was, he was taken and he was put in his mother's arms and, and Marley started to talk to him and he just settled in because he knew that was right where he belonged. And then I was standing just this side and, and there was Marley holding him and I said some words to him and he started to, to use all his strength to crane his neck around to turn towards me. You know, he knew his father's voice because I had talked to him even before he was born. Today we meet Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who's a devout man, he's, he's a part of the Pharisees. Nicodemus, who is a, a religious leader, he's part of, of the Jewish ruling council. Nicodemus, the man who, who wonders if there's more than this because there just seems to be something missing. And he comes to Jesus in the secret of the night. Because there's, there's something compelling to him about Jesus. When he speaks, he seems to be speaking straight from the heart of God. And, and he's able to, to do these miracles by the power of God. There's something there. And Nicodemus wants it and he goes to Jesus and Jesus makes it clear from the, the beginning that, that here is Nicodemus who's clearly still covered by the darkness. Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now you notice when I read it earlier, it said born from above. Born again, born from above. The Greek word is anothen. It, it has both those meanings. Born again, born from above. So which one did Jesus mean? Well, based on the answer and the, the conversation that Jesus and Nicodemus have, <laughs> Jesus meant both. Because what, what, what Nicodemus heard is, you must be born again. And so he, he immediately follows and and in his confusion, he asks, it's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus would make it clear he's talking about a second birth. He's talking here about, about entering into an even greater life. In the 90th Psalm, the poet writes, the days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80. If we are strong, even then their span is only toil and trouble. See, that's why, that's why Nicodemus and so many of us wonder, is this all there is? Because it just seems like, like life ought to be so much more. And so we find ourselves in despair. We are, we're suffering a crisis in our nation right now. You may not know it, but the, the suicide rate is on the increase in our country, and it has been for, for quite some time. And recently, the group that's shown the biggest increase in suicides are girls ages 10 to 14. How can children, how can children get that hopeless? It makes me think of the philosopher who wrote Ecclesiastes. He says, everything's meaningless. Everything's boring. You can't find any meaning in any of it. It's boring to the eyes. It's boring to the ears. There's this darkness 
that covers our nation. And, and there are no government policies that can be written. There's no awareness that can be brought into our schools to fix the problem. Because it's a spiritual issue. We need the Lord, the living God. We need Jesus, the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. And that's why Jesus invites Nicodemus and all of us to enter into this life that is endlessly meaningful. Because he says there, in the, in the third verse, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Then in the fifth verse, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Born of water and the Spirit. If you were to visit the southern steps of the Temple Mount today, you would see these, these dugout areas where there had been pools that, that worshipers would immerse themselves into before they went into the temple itself. Those ceremonial baths are called mikvah. Now for Jews, they, they enter the mikvah when they are converting because it becomes a sign then for, for them to show that they've had a, a real radical change of heart and that they are making this, this complete commitment to the faith. For those who are, are practicing Jews, they enter the mikvah as a sign of purification. You remember how John the Baptist was out in the wilderness? He was inviting his fellow Jews to come into the waters of the river like it's a mikvah. It was a sign of repentance to be purified. But Jesus says you must be born of water and spirit. Not just a, a ritual that you go through. What Jesus is offering is a genuinely new birth, a, a genuine new life, a new beginning for us all. God has spoken through the prophet Ezekiel. There in the 36th chapter, listen to what he says. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Huh. You keep reading in that passage. And the prophet goes on to describe how, how life lived the way that God designs it is, is a full life. It's an abundant life. It's, it's the best life. And that's what Jesus promises here. Not just a ritual to go through, but, but a new life to be lived. A new, a new identity as a child of God. A, a new commitment to following Jesus. A new love with which to serve others. A new boldness because life is everlasting. A new spirit because the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. And so he says that the Holy Spirit comes, comes like that first breath in a baby's lungs that begins a new life. And this life in the kingdom of God, it's not ordinary. There's nothing normal about it. Because it's not normal to love others like you love yourself. It's not normal to love your enemies. It's not normal to, to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry. It's not normal to be neighborly to the unneighborly. <laughs> it's not normal to serve people you don't even like. I mean, who lives like that? Well, Jesus and his followers live like that. We live like that. New birth by water is repentance, turning away from your old life. 
New birth by spirit is embracing this new life that God has for you. You must be born by water and the spirit, he says. Now that, that all sounds kind of intriguing, right? And maybe you, you have that question, okay, if, if we're to be born again, how do I make that happen? You don't. You don't. Because it's a matter of grace. It's, it's a gift that comes from God. Jesus makes that absolutely clear. He says, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. As a recent storm reminded us, we do not control the wind. And the Greek word pneumatos, it means both wind and spirit. We don't command either one. So you hear this, you go, well, well if I can't make it happen, if, if I, I can't cause it to happen, what happens if I'm never born again? Well, let me assure you, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will not miss you. Do you hear that? The Holy Spirit won't miss you because in this, this third chapter, if you read down further in the 17th verse, Jesus makes it very clear. He says, look, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. Do you get it? God wants you to be born again more than you want to be born again. You're not going to, to miss this opportunity that he has for you. And, and remember, you didn't do a whole lot when you got born. And so it is here. In fact, Gracie Allen, Gracie Allen once said, I was so surprised when I was born that I didn't talk for a year and a half. <laughs> But this is, this is a work of God. Jesus makes it clear that we're born again by just trusting God. So put your sail up and, and be ready for, for when this wind blows. I mean, when Jesus was resurrected, he spent time with his disciples, 40 days, just being with them and, and teaching them more. And then as he was about to ascend into heaven, he told his followers to wait for the Holy Spirit. Ten days later at the, the harvest festival called Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in, in such an amazing way that he drew a crowd. And Peter stood up and, and he tried to explain what was going on to everybody who was gathered there. It turned out to be the first Christian sermon. And it says in the second chapter of Acts that while he was preaching, the people were cut to the heart. And they cried out, what should we do? See, like Nicodemus, they realized that there was something missing. And they found in Jesus that missing piece. And so what did Peter say to them? He said, change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Born of water and spirit. So we don't boast about being born again any more than we boast about being born. I mean, how weird would it be to stand up and say, yep, I got born on October 6, 1964. Yep, I made the decision to accept life that day and I just made it, made my way down that birth canal. People would go, you are so weird. Well, you know what? This is all about God's initiative. 
In this third chapter, we, we hear those words that so many of us memorized as kids. One of the most familiar passages in all of the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved and God sent. This is a work of God. The question still hangs out there. Why would anybody want to be born? We'll flip that question around. Why would anyone want to be unborn? Lord Kenneth Clark is one of Britain's most prominent art historians and authors. He's also a producer of the BBC show, Civilization. He writes about a time where he was staying in a villa in France. And there, there he had this encounter with God. It was in the church of San Lorenzo. He knew he knew that, that this was God who was, who was there with him and, and he sensed his presence and, and it was wonderful to him. But listen to, to what he writes as he reflects on it. My faith was far from blameless. I would have to reform. My family was think, would think I was going mad, and perhaps, after all, it was a delusion, for I was in every way unworthy of such a flood of grace. I was too deeply embedded in the world to change course. See, Jesus stood at the door and knocked, and Kenneth Clark refused to open the door to him. Why would you do that? Why would anybody choose to be unborn? So why would you choose to be born? Because you want to live. You want to live life to the fullness. You want to live the life that God intends for you. Here's Nicodemus in this third chapter of John. It's kind of funny though. Nicodemus just seems to, to fade back into the darkness because when we read that third chapter, we're not sure when Jesus quits talking to Nicodemus. He just disappears from the scene. But that's not the end of his story. If you keep reading through the Gospel of John, you see Nicodemus again in the seventh chapter. And there are some of the, the Pharisees and priests, they want Jesus arrested and they, they send the guards to get him, but they, they come back empty-handed because they just don't seem to be able to bring themselves to arrest him. And it was at that point that Nicodemus stood up and he challenged his, his fellow leaders. He said, we, we can't dismiss or condemn Jesus unless we hear from him. Well, because apparently the, the other leaders had already made up their minds about Jesus, they began to speak harshly to Nicodemus. But that's not the end of Nicodemus' story. If you keep reading through, just after the crucifixion, in the 19th chapter of John, there's Nicodemus. And he joins Joseph of Arimathea in putting Jesus into the tomb. We're told that he brought with him 75 pounds of spices to prepare the body for burial. Now just that, that incredible weight of, of spices shows he respected Jesus so much he wanted to give him a proper burial. Now by all the evidence, by all the evidence, the Holy Spirit had come and breathed new life into Nicodemus. In fact, ancient tradition tells us that Nicodemus died as a Christian martyr. 
And he is venerated as Saint Nicodemus. And I have to wonder. I have to wonder if maybe there's a saint here this morning who's just waiting to be born again. I have to wonder if there's a, a child of God and, and this, is, this is your due date. Do you feel that? Feels like, I don't know, a new wind stirring. So be prepared. Be prepared because I think things are about to change. And it might be you. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, consecrate till we are wholly yours and holy in your sight. Amen.